Here at the Youth for Christ Language and Computer School in Guinea-Bissau, West Africa, we didn't have too many great options for powering our school. The national grid here in Guinea-Bissau is only available in the capital city where we are, and even then only works a few days a week, sometimes up to five, but generally only at night, and is very unreliable. We needed a better way to power the school's air conditioners, computers, lights, and fans so the students could have a stable learning experience. The normal way of dealing with that problem here in Guinea-Bissau is through a generator, which is what we did for the first five or six years. Our monthly fuel bill was about 225 gallons at about $5 US per gallon. So it got expensive when our students are only paying between $10 and $15 a month for their classes. We began to study the possibility of using solar power after a donation was given that would be close to the amount that we would need from the estate of Laurel Van Diver to be able to complete this kind of project. The fundamental parts of an off-grid solar system like the one we have are lots of sun, which we don't lack here in Africa, the solar panels to collect the sunlight and convert it to electricity, batteries to store it, and then inverters to take the power from the batteries and turn it into wall current that we can use to run our normal devices and lights. In our case, we bought 60 Kyocera 210 watt panels, and they're mounted in five frames of 12 each. This gives us a theoretical system capacity of, a, of just over 12 kilowatts, although in practice, what we've seen because of losses in the wires and conversion, in general, in very bright sun, we are right around 11 kilowatts or just under at the peak output each day. Here in the West African sun, we generally find that we're starting to collect on our theoretical 12 kilowatt system we're starting to collect at about 7.30 or 8 o'clock in the morning. By 9 o'clock most days, we have an input of about 4 or 5 kilowatts. That tapers up to about 8 kilowatts by the time we get to 10.30 or 11. And then around 12.30 or 1 o'clock, we're at our full output for the day of generally 10 to 10 and a half kilowatts. And then it starts tapering off again in the afternoon by 4 o'clock, we might be back down to 8 or 9,000 9, watts. And then by 6 or 6.30 in the evening, we are effectively down to nothing again. So in our case, we still use our generators in the evening because the cost of purchasing enough extra panels and batteries would have been prohibitively expensive. So we use the solar from the time that we wake up until about four or five or six depending on the load that day and the sun and then we turn the generator on to take care of the load from then until the time classes stop at 10 o'clock at night and then we go back to the batteries from the solar to take us through overnight with our security lights and internet connection here in west africa which is sub-saharan we generally find that the output of each panel is roughly equivalent over the space of the whole day to about five hours worth of full output. So a 200 watt panel over the space of a day would give us about a thousand watts of useful power. Not being trained contractors, it took us about 12 months to complete the construction of the solar project from the time that the container arrived from the U.S. with all the major equipment. Most of the time was spent in the cement work you see to build this structure and then we did all of the steel fabricating for the frames to hold the panels ourselves. We worked carefully and we worked slowly because with no cranes and a hospital here where you're more likely to get a new disease on your way out than you are to get the thing fixed that you came in for, we wanted to make sure that everyone was safe. We carried these beams up from the ground level using cords. We fabricated these separately on the ground in two pieces. This spine was the first piece brought up, carried across by hand, and then welded in place. And then the, the top table part was brought up as a separate piece, fitted to the top, measured to be exact, and then welded in place. And then the next spine was brought up 
put in place and the next tabletop and so on until the end. So the construction phase from the first shovel full of dirt to the day that we turned the switch on was about 12 months of, of continuous work for a team of, of between three and five guys. Several people have asked me about our washing habits with our panels. Here in West Africa we have a rainy season and a dry season where it will never rain or in the rainy season it rains almost every single day pouring. We did a little test when we were installing our panels because we first hooked up one frame and it was working while we were installing and hooking up the second and that was connected while we were installing and hooking up the third. So when we reached the end we had a good comparison for one frame of 12 panels into the same controller that was clean because it had just been installed and one frame that had about six weeks worth of dust on it and it's pretty dusty here. What we found was that the difference between fresh clean panels and the old ones were about a 30 or 35 percent loss. But the curious thing that we found was over the first five or seven days we were only losing maybe five or ten percent of the power and then as it went into the second, third, or fourth week unwashed, we lost a lot. But then after that, it didn't appear to continue losing much more, much more power, even though the panels still looked very dirty. I think the takeaway, if you're in a dry season and it's a dusty place, is that you either need to wash the panels every week or so to maintain that 90, 95% efficient, or never bother because after three or four or five weeks they didn't appear to lose much more being left to continue on. In the rainy season obviously with pouring rains every day we don't bother washing them at all. For the electrical parts of our system we chose the Xantrex XW series of chargers and inverters and each of the five banks that are mounted upstairs of panels are connected to one of these controllers. The controllers take the power from the solar panels and then convert it down to match the voltage that the battery bank is using. So in our system for this capacity we use a 48 volt system which amounts to four batteries that are 12 volts connected together and then several groups of those to increase the capacity. Each of these controllers is capable of handling 60 amps of output, which at a 48 volt battery system like ours means that each one can handle about 2,500 watts of power. The controllers each control one frame of 12 panels up on the roof, and the panels are connected in groups of four. So our controllers can take an input of anything up to 150 volts, I believe is the spec. In our case, we run four panels in series to make a nominal voltage of 120 volts to give us a bit of a buffer zone. And then we take three of those groups paralleled together to fill the capacity of each controller. So for each frame of 12 panels up top, we're taking three groups of four of them to end up with approximately 120 volts coming in on about 20 or 22 amps at, at our normal 10 or 11 kilowatts of total output. So each controller is controlling about 2400 or 2500 watts, which ends up being about 120 volts at about 20 amps. Our electrical system is still in progress. We've had a difficult uh, time balancing wanting to do things right with the fact that local components aren't available. So the initial equipment was sent over in a shipping container and when we found out what we were missing each time my family and I fly back over here from the states we bring a couple more pieces to try and get the thing finished off. We wanted to do it as close to NEC code as we could. I'm not an electrician but we wanted to make sure that everything was well protected and connected correctly. In some cases, we've been fairly successful. We got good conduit coming out of all these controllers to protect those lines. But in other cases, we've had to find a local way of doing it just so that we could get the system going. And in some of those cases, they are far from NEC code. 
one of the places that we had to compromise in order to get the system going was in this circuit breaker box. This box should have been much bigger. It should have been a proper combiner box, but we didn't know we needed one when we sent the equipment over. So this is actually where the different groups of solar panels are being combined to go into the controller. So each of these input breakers, there are five of them, one for each controller, has three wires coming into it, which is how we're paralleling the three groups of, of four panel clusters to go into each controller. And then out of that comes one set of four gauge wires that goes into the controller. Another four gauge set of wires comes back out of the controller into these output breakers and then heads over to the main circuit breaker where it joins them to the battery bank. Our battery bank is built out of 20 12 volt, 200 and something amp hour AGM sealed batteries. They weigh about 200 pounds a piece, about 100 kilograms, and this room doesn't have any, any normal doors. There are trap doors in the top and bottom to make it more difficult to break into. So each of these batteries we brought up with uh, cords and this metal rack needed to be pretty beefy to support all the weight of all these batteries. So we did fabricate that, but there are no doors in this room big enough for this rack to fit into. What we did was build three of the walls. We carried this up using cords, set it in place, and then built the fourth wall. So it will never leave this room. They are, as I said, it's a 48 volt system. So there are four of them in series to create one 48 volt, 200 amp hour battery. And then five of those groups are paralleled together to give us a total capacity of about 1,000 amp hours at 48 volts. This size of system I think is a little bit small for a system whose collecting capacity is the size that ours is, but um, the system was funded in one shot. It's unlikely that there's going to be another uh, group of money coming in to replace these batteries, with, with, which with an off-grid system will happen probably in five or seven or maybe if we're lucky, ten years. So we didn't want to oversize the batteries and create a, a big running cost since we have to figure that into our monthly running costs to be able to have money available to pay for another set of batteries. So our solution, rather than trying to do the whole problem solar, has been that we're going to use the sun when it's there and have enough battery capacity to provide for surges because of motors turning on or because of the couple of hours in the afternoon where the sun is still there but is not putting out full capacity. We have enough batteries to take care of that and then leave a couple of security lights and in our, in our internet router on at night, but not enough so that we can just run the system all night long. We figured out that in order to do that, we would need about twice as many panels and four or five times as many batteries. And in our case, it wasn't economical. So we did what we could do economically, and then we leave the rest of the generator. This box behind me is the distribution box where we combine the power of the battery bank with the power coming from the solar charge controllers and then distribute it here to the inverters, which convert it into normal power for the, for the socket and is sent back out to the school. This distribution box is another example of a place where we had to balance getting it done with getting it done properly. I'm sure in the States there would have been a much better way to do this, but in our case we had to do it with what we had available over here. So we actually have some distribution blocks capable of handling the roughly 500 amps that can be moving through this system. DC at any given time depending on charge and the draw and the inverters. So we actually made these copper distribution blocks here that are made out of copper bar drilled and tapped to be able to make all the connections from the different controllers to the different batteries. I'm again sure that this is far from any C code and we do have a cover being made to cover this whole thing up to take the danger away from fingers in, in these areas. But no one's ever up here so for now that this has worked fine. These Xantrex hybrid inverter chargers are what takes the power from the solar panels and batteries and converts it into normal wall current that we can use to run our devices. In our case, our system is a three-phase system, so we actually have three separate inverter units that are all connected together, and one of them controls each of the three phases. 
These inverter chargers are actually really cool and we're not using them to their full capacity. They're capable of also being grid connected. In our case, they're only connected to our generator because the grid power is unstable. So we connect them to our generator. They can charge the batteries from the generator when the generator is on. They can support the generator when the charge that's being drawn from it goes above what the generator can provide. These can jump in and provide the last couple of amps that are necessary that the generator is not capable of providing. These are Xantrex XW6048s and they're the international version. So they're six kilowatt inverters and they run on a 48 volt battery system. That's the nomenclature of the naming 6048. And then these are the international version because our power system here is 220 50 hertz rather than the 110 60 that we use in the States.